parole and defense. Uh, this one probably everybody knows, but if you don't, uh, it's a great resource. And uh, this one is a great resource too. It's, it's focused on the bamboo corals, but um, the illustrations are really stunning. And it shows you the diversity of uh, shapes and uh, zonation arrangement of uh, sclerites and polyps. So it's, um, we won't be using it today because we don't have time to go into uh, genera, but uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's very illustrative of the morphological diversity of uh, the bamboo corals. And we have this uh, small book on PDF on the USB key. Yeah. If you want it, you can take the yes, USB key. So I put it by the coffee if, uh, if you want to have a look. Uh, please uh, uh, feel free. So it's okay? It's recording? Mm -hmm. Yes? Yes. Okay. So uh, we have um, the, the chance to have uh, someone focusing on soft corals. So uh, we're going to split the work. And I'm going to talk about uh, the Gorgonian sea fan like uh, octocorals. And uh, Hudi Benayahu is uh, going to talk about uh, the soft corals. Uh, so, first, uh, as you know, octocorals are, can be loosely defined as uh, 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 entozoans with uh, eight pinnate tentacles. They belong to um, the subphylum Entozoa. And uh, there are now 79 families recognized and as of last year. Uh, 79 families, 40, um, 413 genera, and roughly 3,500 species. And uh, uh, there is uh, about uh, 65 specialists uh, working on and off on this taxa. Uh, so, this number, I, uh, I got it from uh, the uh, a database of, uh, that I tried to compile on uh, all the records of octocorals throughout the world. Uh, and among these uh, 56, 55, uh, 65, I'm sorry, specialists, there are 18 working on deep sea uh, uh, taxa. So, as you know, you know, I'm probably preaching to the choir, but uh, octocorals are a fascinating group because uh, they uh, constitute um, um, uh, whole ecosystems. Uh, they are very broadly distributed. They are very diverse. Uh, as you can see here on uh, this uh, global map, I plotted, um, so these are museum records. Uh, from the USNM, Yale, Australian Museum, uh, and this uh, amounts to 30,000 records. And then I plotted the MNHN uh, with almost uh, 5,000 uh, records. And uh, uh, there are areas that are very well uh, sampled, and there are areas for which we have no samples. So there are deserts of, uh, still deserts of, uh, uh, in terms of sampling. Uh, and what's also stunning uh, is that there are areas that are very well, relatively speaking, very well studied, but still we don't reach an asymptote when we look at uh, species diversity and species richness. So who knows, you know, what, what is in these areas. Um, so many, it's, it just says many octocorals are uh, deep. So uh, this, this figure is from a, a paper by Gary Williams on uh, sea pens. And it shows you that uh, most of, sea, of the sea pens are a deep taxa. And uh, look at the scale here. This is depth in meters and this is a thousand meters. So most of these taxa are quite deep actually. So, for instance, I don't know if uh, everything is uh, is quite readable from people in the in the back, but uh, the red taxa uh, have a maximum depth uh, that is uh, greater than two thousand meters, for example. Waiting for the computer to. Uh to change uh, slides. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. And uh, one thing I wanted to point out since we're here and the material we're going to uh, be uh, looking at comes from the Paris Museum. I thought it'd be interesting to show you this figure which shows that compared to other museums, the depth range that is uh, uh, that corresponds to the samples that are stored here uh, is on average uh, larger than uh, elsewhere. So this is interesting because potentially we can see taxa that are not uh, in other collections because they tend to be deeper. Okay, so as I said, the material that we're going to be looking at comes mostly from the, exclusively actually, from the Tropical Deep Sea Bantos program. And I'm not going to uh, detail this slide because Sarah talked about it this morning. And in a nutshell, on this map of the, uh, the, the tropical uh, um, Western Pacific, uh, the red square are areas where the museum sampled for uh, uh, bento, uh, bentic uh, species. And also in a nutshell, because we've talked about it, uh, these are the methods that we use to get these samples. So we use uh, trolling and dredging. Uh, and uh, I really like this slide because you can see a well here. <laughs> And uh, this is pure serendipity. It was an uh, it was an accident. It's a lucky accident. So when we uh, when we uh, troll, we get uh, catches uh, like this, and uh, and then uh, you know you get corals and get amazed. Uh, so this is a bubblegum coral, Paragorgia, and this is Batia alcyon. And believe it or not, these things are now in the same family. So we get all that uh, biomass and uh, we have to sort it and do it quite fast because you are in the tropical uh, Pacific and so the temperatures are uh, high and uh, we want to get these uh, specimens uh, in a cool environment or pr uh, fix uh, the, the tissues as fast as possible. So um, we try to do a, a quick sorting, you know, like echinoderms, mollusks, cnidarians. We don't go uh, into detail. And, uh, and we try to uh, take um, uh, DNA samples uh, as much as we can. And for the groups that we know are sensitive, you know, that uh, degrade fast and, and groups that we know that are going to be studied uh, in a short time frame. So uh, I thought I'd give you uh, a few of the considerations that I uh, I think of when I go to sea and I want to collect uh, octocorals. So this is by no means uh, an extensive list and be sure to add your own thoughts if you want. But uh, because uh, these um, um, taxa can be very fragile, uh, it's really important to be prepared to, uh, to, to get set up before uh, the trolling and dredging starts and to have a, a, a reservoir of a cold seawater, if you can, so that when uh, you get your corals, you can put them in sea, uh, cold seawater uh, as soon as possible prior to fixation and preservation. Uh, um, I suppose everybody knows the difference between fixation and preservation, right? If you don't, uh, don't hesitate to ask. Um, we're trying to uh, use uh, methods to preserve, uh, to fix and preserve tissues uh, that is compatible with both morphology and uh, molecular studies. And this is uh, uh, usually molecular grade 80% ethanol uh, that works uh, really fine for the, the octocorals. Uh, if you go above uh, that percentage, the, the octocorals tend to dry up and the polyps can fall down and you damage your sample. It gets dehydrated. And if you go below that, uh, it's the DNA that gets uh, degraded. So we, we don't use a formalin anymore. Um, I told a few of you over lunch on Monday that uh, we've tried uh, RNA later 
but the low pH of our annihilator tends to degrade um, the calcified parts of uh, animals. So this is only good for DNA, not for morphology. It's uh, really uh, paramount to have uh, excellent bookkeeping skills, you know, uh, take photographs, take notes, uh, make labels, and we are going to talk about labels. Uh, and uh, we try to avoid separating uh, associate species because uh, there is a lot of uh, evolutionary biology information um, uh, linked to the biological associations. So either we keep associates together or we separate them, but we, we try to keep good notes about uh, who is live, lives with whom. Uh, work safe, beware of chemicals such as uh, formal, formalin, especially in confined spaces. Even uh, ethanol can be dangerous if, uh, you're in, if you're in a closed lab at uh, 50, 50 degrees Celsius. So uh, it's important to, to keep safe. And uh, there are some taxa that we know when it's really hot in this area, they degrade very fast. So uh, you see, for example, sea pens, they literally melt uh, uh, when they uh, are exposed to heat. And some taxa can produce huge amount of mucus uh, that uh, can be troublesome for preservation and then for DNA extraction because the mucus is, uh, uh, interferes with the DNA extraction process. And, uh, you know, we've talked about this. I think it was a question by uh, uh, Houdi this morning um, to Sarah, uh, asking about separating individuals. And, uh, of course, this is the best practice, but uh, necessity, uh, I think there's a French saying that says uh, necessity has a vote. So once you can't, when you can't, you, uh, you have to make uh, uh, groups of specimens. But, um, of course, there is uh, always a risk of cross-contamination. Comp when you're back in the lab, uh, rule number one is uh, make sure bookkeeping is uh, spot on. Uh, no shortcuts about uh, bookkeeping and uh, taking notes. Uh, make sure that the paper that you use uh, is um, is long term, is good for long term uh, um, archival. Uh, so there are pens that are really good uh, with a, a Japanese pen with a. Uh, long time archival, there are paper that are ethanol resistant, water resistant, and uh, it's important to keep original labels. So if you want to add a new label that has more information, don't, don't throw out the original label. And uh, I've, I've put keep it moist because, uh, so in when you're in the field, you keep it cold. You're, when you're back in the lab, you keep it uh, wet because when colonies uh, dry out, so octocorals, the, the polyps get very brittle and uh, they tend to fall as well if you, uh, if you hurt them. Uh, you know, for example, taking in and out of, uh, of a bag, um, polyps can fall out. So try to keep it moist. Usually we take uh, these trays and uh, we put a, a little bit of ethanol in, the, uh, in, the, in, the, um, in it so that uh, the, the, the sea fan, for example, sits in a bath of ethanol. And uh, I think uh, this was uh, talked about uh, by Stefan, you know, uh, as I said multiple times, the, the, the labeling is uh, very crucial. And again, I'm sure I'm preachy, pre preaching to the choir, but uh, when you're in the field and you have little time, make sure that where and when uh, the sampling occurred is on the label and then what you use to preserve it. So if you use for formalin for some odd reason, uh, uh, put it in. And then the, um, the tentative taxonomic ID, to me, it's, it's, uh, it's secondary because, you know, it's an hypo a hypothesis anyways and it will change and uh, you don't have your books and your comparative samples with you. So, uh, this is not a priority, at least in my opinion. This is, you know, field work label. So now that uh, we've gone uh, at sea, uh, got seasick, uh, got corals and got better, 
that we made beautiful labels and uh, have uh, well-preserved uh, specimens, we can do taxonomy. Uh, and uh, I'm sure most of you know about uh, this uh, groundbreaking paper that came out uh, less than a year ago by uh, Kathy McFadden, Lynn uh, Van Afwegen, and uh, Andrea Quattrini, who uh, used uh, a large number of uh, nuclear uh, DNA markers to infer um, a robust phylogeny and revise uh, the octocorallia. And their goal was to uh, uh, look specifically at, at a, a deep uh, relationship within the octocorallia. And uh, on the right here, I should put uh, major, the major revisions that they've, they, they've done. So for example, um, the medusozoa is now a subphylum. The entozoa is now a subphylum. And within the entozoa, octocorallia is now a class with two new uh, uh, orders, the Malacalcionacea uh, the Malacalcionacea and the Scleralcionacea. And I'm going to talk of course more about this in a minute. But I, I wanted to, to talk about the evidence and wh why this is groundbreaking and, and why this is important. And it, it's linked to the method. The method is, a, is a quite robust. Why? Because um, they used a new technique, a relatively new technique. Uh, it's, uh, it's about seven years old, uh, that uh, targets areas of the genome that are highly conserved throughout the amnutes. So, a very large uh, taxonomic group. And these loci are not necessarily uh, genes that encode proteins. Most of them are non-coding. So they're probably uh, regulatory uh, elements. And, and you can find them uh, in many, uh, many animals. And uh, looking at the polymorphism that's on the DNA, when you uh, go farther from the conserved core of these elements, this polymorphism, this genetic polymorphism, give you information about uh, the, the phylogenetic relationships among uh, taxa. And uh, there are over 700 of those loci, and they're unlinked. So uh, they were, uh, you know, mixed uh, by, uh, uh, by recombination throughout uh, evolutionary times. And having so many loci give you very good statistical power. So this is actually a very good tool to look at uh, um, uh, systematics of, uh, of a problematic group like the octocorallia. And they used also uh, that uh, mitochondrial gene called MTMUTS, uh, which was used heavily uh, in the field uh, for over 20 years. And this is because it was the uh, one of the uh, more uh, polymorphic marker, mitochondrial marker, that we had, and uh, that uh, uh, could be uh, sequenced. Uh, uh, reliably across many octocoral specimens. But one gene, especially if it's mitochondrial, it's not sufficient to, uh, to infer deep phylogeny. So uh, let's go back to the systematics. Now that we, uh, we are confident that uh, the, the evidence on which the revision, revision was done is actually uh, the state of the art when it comes to uh, phylogenomic techniques. Uh, so the first uh, of these uh, two orders that, have, that I have trouble uh, pronouncing is Cleralcionacea, and uh, it corresponds to a clade that was first described uh, in 2010 by Kathy McFadden and colleagues, and that groups the Calcaxonia and the Sipens, the Penatulacea. Okay? And the second one is the Malacalcionacea, which again, you know, uh, corresponds to a group that uh, links the Olaxonia and the Alcionina, and again uh, described by uh, Cassie McFadden in uh, 2010. The first one 
uh, groups all the sepans in one super family. So you have 15 sepan families within one super family. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about sepan. And then uh, the rest are 20 families, uh, four of which are new or reinstated. Okay. Um, in the Malac Alcionacea, there are 33 families, uh, 14 of which are new or reinstated. And uh, since there are many of these uh, families, uh, that some of, some of them are typically shallow, some of them are uh, restricted to the, the Antarctic Ocean, for example, I made a, a, a subsample of these families uh, to present to you today. Um, and uh, these are listed here. And so these are families that are accepted today uh, after the revision by uh, Kathy McFadden and colleagues. And they are uh, considered deep sea, occur below 200 meters depth, and they have a, a, a hard skeletal axis. Okay, so they can be considered sea fans or goronians uh, in opposition to uh, soft corals. And then you have another group that are what they call moderately deep, uh, that occur between 50 and 200 meters depth, uh, again, uh, with a hard skeletal axis and uh, coming from the Pacific. So you have this subset of, uh, of families. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is uh, I'm going to give you um, a primer of, uh, of uh, morphological taxonomy for octocorals, and then I'm, uh, I'm going to, uh, to give you an overview of how it applies to these groups, uh, which are most likely to be, uh, or should rephrase, the specimens that you're going to look at the more most likely uh, fall into these uh, bins. Okay. So I double click on the pin. Okay. All right. So I'm going to uh, to present some anatomical features. And uh, unless otherwise stated, the um, the slides that I show you come from uh, uh, Ted Bears and colleagues. Um, uh, trilingual glossary on the uh, octocoral um, taxonomy. And this is a great resource. I'm going to put together a list of uh, texts that are, uh, um, I think, very useful. Uh, and this is one of them because it has great illustration of the diversity of, uh, of forms, uh, morphological forms that you find in the, in the class. So uh, when you look at an octocoral, of course, you have polyps with eight pinnate tentacles, and they are organized as a colony. There is one um, non-colonial octocoral, Tayaroa. We're going to talk about it, but all the all, all the other ones are uh, colonial. And uh, so uh, here is one polyp. Here here is another one, and this is a cross section of a polyp that is done uh, about here. Okay, in the next zone. Okay, so uh, with your polyps, you have your tentacles. When I say that they are pinnate, uh, I'm talking about these little things here, these little uh, fleshy projections that can contain sclerites. So this is um, a taxonomic uh, character. And then you have uh, here, not in all octocorals, but you have a, you can have a crown of sclerites. Uh, I think it's more like a ne necklace, really, because you call, you call that the neck. So, you know, you have like a, a nice little uh, area with a uh, sclerite. So instead of crown, I, pro I propose necklace. And then um, the neck is here. And this area is called the entocodia. So when you look at the description and you see entocodial sclerites, these are the sclerites that belong to this area. And then the, the, the area where uh, the entocodia meets uh, the branch senenchyme is uh, called the entostem. Okay, and if we look at uh, the, the cross section here of uh, our polyp coming uh, on the neck here, what we see is the pharynx, so this gastrovascular cavity here with the mesenteries 
and the polyp can be um, oriented according to the siphonoglyph, which is a groove, a ciliated groove that uh, octocorals have. It can be very uh, developed. And these uh, cilia are going to, pro, um, uh, to, to, uh, to make a water flow within uh, the, uh, the gastrovascular cavity and move food around and uh, ensure uh, water pressure within uh, the polyp. So this is the siphonoglyph. And the polyp can be oriented according to the position of the siphonoglyph. So you call the ventral side of the polyp the side closer to the siphonoglyph. Okay, and uh, it's also called the sulcal side because uh, the, the old name for the uh, uh, siphonoglyph is called the sulcus. And then you have another asulcal side. So this is the dorsal side that is opposite to the siphonoglyph. So if you have characters that pertain to internal morphology of corals, it's not frequent, but it happens, uh, you can refer to these terms. Okay. All right. So this is now a cross section from the uh, down on the branch. Okay. So this is your 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 um your gorgon, and then you make a cross section. So the branch is here. The skeletal axis is here, and you have multiple polyps here. And on these polyps, you can see the mesenteries, and you can see uh, gonads and. Uh, and uh, and uh, the different uh, uh, different canals that make up uh, the the stem and the stem uh, composition uh, differs depending on uh, the family you look at. So, for example, it can be made of sclerites. Uh, it can not have sclerites. Be made just of gorgonin, etc. So the composition of uh, of the, the axis here differs depending on the group. And uh, it's, it's, it's after lunch, so it's not, I'm not going to go uh, uh, all over all these terms, but uh, if you want to talk about it, let, let me know. Uh, so I, I told you that uh, there was one taxon uh, that is solitary, and uh, you might think, oh, this is it because it looks like something that is attached to the, uh, to the substrate as one big polyp. But actually, it's not the only polyp. You have other polyps here. And these polyps are called siphonozoids. And the siphonozoids are called like that because the siphonoglyph is very uh, developed. So you have one otozoid and multiple siphonozoids. When you have one type of polyp, only, for example, uh, um, not for example, only autozoids, you have a monomorphic uh, colony, one type of polyp. If you have multiple, you have dimorphic colony types. And you see this often in diagnosis of uh, octocoral taxa. So I, uh, I, I uh, gave the definitions here uh, of autozoids and siphonozoids. Uh, these definitions come again from Berenal, uh, uh, 1983, which is, uh, in my opinion, a very uh, still a very pertinent uh, reference. So uh, the autozoid is uh, response to a polyp with uh, well-developed tentacles and mesenteries, and it's the only kind of polyp in monomorphic species. Okay, we talked about that. Then the siphonozoids. Uh, are polyps with strongly developed siphonoglyph and reduced tentacles. And you can um, also have no tentacle uh, on these uh, siphonoglyphs. And the, mes the mesenterial filaments tend to be reduced. And as I said, you have dimorphic or morph 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 monomorphic colonies, depending on whether you have just autozoids and these two. There are more uh, subtle things uh, about this, but uh, uh, we're going to keep it simple. Ah, yeah, I feel. So we're going to talk about uh, macromorphological characters now and how they can be used for uh, taxonomy. 
So the first thing that you can look at, of course, uh, it's the overall colony form, whether you have a planar octocoral. So if you, in one plane, it looks like this, and in one plane, you see that it's planar, okay? It branches only in one plane, planar. The colony can be pinnate. Uh, so you have these alternating branches. Uh, it can be dichotomous. So you have just bifurcations on the colony. It can be uh, bushy, so this is self-explanatory, but it's different from what uh, octocoral taxonomists call a bottle brush. And in French, uh, I think it's more cure pipe, you know, the thing you use to uh, clean your pipe, if you have a pipe. <laughs> but uh, yeah, a bottle brush, uh, if you have a baby and uh, you need to clean the, the, um, the water bottle, the milk bottle. Uh, sparse uh, branching, rare branching, uh, bushy again. So this can be uh, uh, have a, a complex three-dimensional structure, and they can be reticulate. What does it mean? Is that the branches that bifurcated are joined by tissue again? Okay. So this is a reticulate uh, uh, colon, and then depending on how uh, the branches emerge, we can talk about monopodial or sympodial colonies. So monopodial is that you have a skeletal axis, and from the skeletal axis, you have secondary branches that emerge. Sympodial is that the primary branch becomes a secondary branch, and the secondary branch becomes the primary branch, and this alternates. So this is a sympodial colony. There are other characters that are macromorphological and can be important. Uh, you know, size. So for example, if you have a colony like this, tyrate, is it that big or is it, uh, you know, as big as uh, the desk? Uh, uh, is it hard? Is it soft? Is it uh, uh, prickly on your, by the touch, you know? Uh, what's the color when it's live and when it's preserved? Uh, what's the smell? Uh, I remember uh, being on the uh, on the uh, Cape um, uh, Cape Horn uh, field sampling, and we got a huge haul of primnoids, and the whole deck smelled like fresh cucumbers. The the plant, not the sea cucumber, uh, and the, the smell was just very uh, uh, very much like uh, cucumber. So all of these are clues, you know, about uh, what you're looking at. Another example I thought about is uh, bioluminescence in the case of isidids. So if you take your, your coral colony and you take in a in a dark space, you uh, tickle it with, a, your, with your forceps, it can produce light. Okay. Your colonies can be uh, unbranched. So it's just one skeletal axis. Uh, like this taxon, it's suppressible gidae, it's called radicipes, or it can be uh, a branching and you can have nodes and internodes. So this is a, what we call a bamboo coral because it has a strongly calcified internode and pro, a protein, uh, proteinaceous uh, nodes, okay? And this gives, uh, this gives some flexibility uh, to the gorgonian. So is this too uh, too uh, introductory or uh, is it okay? No, it's okay. Okay. Let me know if you want me to uh, go faster or slower. Um, the base is another uh, macromorphological character that is easy to score in these animals. So you have you can have a root-like calcified network. So this is the base of uh, a chrysogorgid coral, or you can have a discoid uh, base uh, that um, allows incrustation of the colony on the substrate. So you tend to see this uh, on the substrate, like sand, sediment, and you tend to see this on hard substrate. So yeah, you can actually infer some things about the environment when you look at these characters. Uh, okay, so um, the placement of branches uh, relative to each other can be uh, 
um, a taxonomy character. And uh, to me, a, ne a neat example of that is what you uh, you see uh, in the genus Chrysogorgia. And in Chrysogorgia, you have a main axis. I'm going to show you uh, colonies as well, of course. You have a main axis. And if you look at the reference branch on the proximal part of the colony, then the next branches are spiraling along this axis. Okay, So here it goes counterclockwise, branch one, two, three, four, five, six. And when you arrive on branch six, uh, so I took this model and uh, I, I, uh, I, I'm looking up now and I see the reference branch and branch six is on the same plane as the reference branch. And uh, in this group, uh, one taxonomic character is actually to define the branching sequence. So how many branches does it take to make one, rev one revolution? Sometimes you cannot uh, have a single revolution to come back on the same plane. You need multiple. So this was the original uh, uh, drawing by Verslui in 1902, uh, trying to uh, to uh, to show how this works. And uh, I'm I tried to do it with a SketchUp model, you know, SketchUp. Um, so I, I see people falling asleep, so it's time for the quiz. <laughs> so I put a picture of a, of a Chrysogorgia, and this colony has a branching sequence. And uh, if you want to play, you can uh, flash this uh, QR code with your laptop or your, uh, your cell phone, and it will ask you what's the branching sequence. And uh, if you want to play, you can come closer, have a look. Uh, so you have some, some choices. And I did this because I was uh, expecting uh, to see many different results. And uh, the reason I do this is to, uh, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I think these characters are extremely hard to score on photographs. But this is what um, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, people try to do with uh, ROV uh, data. Sometimes they try to uh, assign you know, a species name to a, to, a, to a taxon from pictures, and it can be very tricky. So uh, you know, this, this is a, it, it looks like a simple uh, character to score, but it's actually quite tricky. Mm -hmm. I've, I've seen talks at the meetings where people had lists of uh, Chrysogorgia species, you know, to the species name, like 15 species from ROV pictures. And I'm like, how you know, they have the ultra vision. <laughs> we don't have the same glasses. <laughs> so uh, have uh, anyone uh, voted yet? Can we look at the results? Yeah. Oh, that's done. What is it? Compiling, compiling. Did it work? So it's interesting. We don't have a consensus, uh, but uh, all of these who uh, ruled out this were right, and this is the correct uh, answer. So it's actually not bad. I'm surprised, but I have a tougher one. Yeah. Okay, let's move to the. So what about this one? <laughs> This is just to shake you up. I have a hard time when even and when I have it in my hands. 
And to me, the best way is to take the colony and put it like this. And usually you can see grooves, you know, of uh, where there are no branches that overlap. And you can see the sequence. But um, it's tough, isn't it? Yeah. Has uh, anyone voted yet? Not yet? You will make a knot with your uh, your brain, your neurons. Yeah. <laughs> and this is a taxon that comes uh, from uh, New England seamounts and was uh, uh, collected by ROV. So it's a taxon that you can see on videos and on uh, still images. A few more seconds before people have seizures. <laughs> this is very interesting. Yeah, this is the right answer. Super. I'm very surprised because this is actually the, it's the tougher one and uh, uh, the results are really good. Can you explain why? Can show us arrive to this result? Yeah. Can show on the picture, please. Oh yes. Yeah. So on this picture, it's it's, uh, it's very hard, but on this one, uh, you have one branch coming like this. Okay. Then you have one coming like this. So this is my reference branch. This is one, two, and three. And this branch and this branch are on the same plane. And it takes three branches to go from the reference to, uh, to this one, okay? And, uh, and here you are counterclockwise, okay? And when it becomes very tricky is that the, the branching sequence can change with a growth. So it can start uh, with a certain sequence and change. You can add a branch all of a sudden. And I've, I even saw a very peculiar case where you had one Chrysogorgia with a branching sequence, and one of the side branch became a main stem, and it had like an offshoot with a different branching sequence. And you don't see this uh, reported in the literature. It's very peculiar. Do we have any ecology or evolutionary hypothesis for why it is so stable? So stable? Uh, no. No, uh, I uh, so I actually took the branching sequences and I uh, so for example, if you need two re revolutions and five branches, you can actually calculate the angle, and uh, all the combinations are represented in nature. And uh, I tried to test uh, when I was uh, doing my PhD. I tried to test the idea that um, uh, there is a um, what do you say? Continuum? Yeah, that um, a phylogenetic signal linking uh, the width of the angle and uh, the amount of evolution that you have from an unbranching form. But uh, at the time, I had just the mitochondrial data, so uh, they seemed to be a signal, but it was extremely noisy, and I don't think it was uh, uh, no, good to interpret it. That's the only attempt I know of. So um, I call this macromorphological characters, although I'm showing you uh, SEM, so scanning electron microscopy uh, pictures, but still you can see it with, with your naked eye because these polyps can be quite uh, large. They can be over a millimeter uh, uh, large. They can be two, uh, over two millimeters large. Uh, so. Uh, other characters that you can score, for example, from a, if you have a good uh, ROV shot, you can look at the orientation of polyps. So uh, the polyp can be facing uh, the ground. Okay? And it's called proxima because the proximal uh, end of the colony 
the one attached to the the, the sea floor is uh, so it's called the proximal side, right? So it's look at the it's looking at the proximal side, and then the distal is looking at the distal part of the colony. So it's called distal. The polyp is looking at, and then you can have perpendicular polyps. So this is actually quite easy to score, and you can do it with your naked eye, and it's uh, it's quite uh, informative for groups like the the golden corals, the pomnaria. Uh, we we also have the coordination of polyps that can be scored from an ROV uh, uh, shot, for example. So it's how the different polyps are arranged relative to each other. So it can be irregular. So the main branch is here, the skeletal axis, and then you have your polyps. Uh, it can form a spiral. So boop, 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 boop. you can see it here, no, like this. It can be biserial, so one polyp, another, 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 another biserial. It can be pairs, pair, pair. So they are on either side of uh, the branch and are connected by a sclerite, for example. It can be in whorls, and the fancy name is verticillate. Okay, so uh, now we're not looking at the colony like this. Okay, we are looking at it from the top. Okay, and these are whorls of polyps. polyps. Okay, and uh, this is actually. Um, a rare case of a uh, um, taxon that is called Enimactylon, and uh, it's a, a primnoid coral that has uh, polyps uh, that are shaped like leaves. You have a bouquet of polyp, of polyps, multiple polyps uh, forming a leaf. And then you have the stuff that you cannot uh, look at with your naked eye. That uh, require some preparation in the lab. So uh, I call that the quintessential optical character. It's the, the sclerite shape, so the shape of an individual polyp, uh, sclerite, I'm sorry, and it's zonation. And what I, 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 uh, I think about when I say zonation is the placement of different types of sclerites on the polyp. And uh, Tina Molotsova had a term for that. She proposed the sclerome. The sclerome is the uh, all the, the different shape of sclerites on the different parts of the core. What is a sclerite? Uh, so always the same uh, uh, literature source, Bear um, et al, uh, sorry, I'm sorry, I forgot, Bear et al, 1983. It, uh, the sclerites are calcareous elements, irrespective of form in the mesoglia, also occurring in the axis of scleracton. So now they are packed up around, uh, around the, uh, the skeletal axis, okay, and uh, it's very unless the taxon doesn't have sclerites, sclerites will be reported on the description of these taxa. It's it's really a uh, uh, quintessential uh, uh, character, and it's a very variable character. So always in the same book, uh, Berenthal uh, eighty three, uh, they have. Uh, a glossary of all the different forms that you can have for sclerite shape. And this is one of uh, four or five plates showing you the diversity of form. Okay, and uh, you can have needles, rods, fused rods here. You can have spindles. The spindles are more like, a, you know, a, they have a larger width in the middle. Uh, you can have, uh, uh, cones, spines, crutches, bifurcating rods, and uh, there was even one uh, uh, sclerite that I, uh, I I didn't think I, I should uh, show it because uh, it's uh, it's just uh, so bizarre. Uh, Really looks like a butt. I'll show it to you next. <laughs> yeah. So this is the texture of a sculpture at the surface of the sclerite. Okay, so you zoom out on the sclerite. The sclerite is not necessarily smooth. It can have a granular structure, a thorny structure, tubercular uh, sculpture, etc. Okay, and these uh, these ornaments. Uh, are taxonomic characters, and they don't necessarily occur on all the sclerites of, uh, that are on the polyp or on the branch. They can be just on the, bol the, the body wall of uh, the polyp, for example. 
And uh, I'm sorry, I forgot to put the image, but uh, the sclerite surface uh, can show um, uh, interesting diffraction patterns uh, under polarized light. And this is a, a taxonomic character for some taxa. Uh, if you are interested, I can show you some pictures. I have them on my computer. I just forgot to put it. So now, how do you, how do you get to these characters? Uh, so we are going to, to talk about uh, how to get to that. So this is a polyp of Chrysogorgia, the spiraling coral. And it was obtained after um, short exposure to household bleach. And I, I, uh, I put it in bleach and then I put it in uh, um, water to stop the digestion of tissue, the dissolution of tissue. And when you remove the epidermis, so the upper layer of, uh, of tissue, then the, um, the sclerites become apparent. So these are the sclerites that are oriented within the axis of the tentacles. And so you should have eight of these if you go all around the, the polyp. And uh, this picture was taken under polar, polarized light, so you can actually see these diffraction patterns on the sclerites. So how do you get to that? I, I hope we have the time to actually test this today or tomorrow. So uh, it's, uh, it, it's not something that you try and su succeed at right away, at least not me. Uh, so it requires some practice. So my uh, um, advice would be to find some polyps that are not precious and practice on those. And of course, it's going to depend on uh, on the taxon because uh, depending on the genus, family, species, the thickness of the epidermis differs. So the amount of bleach and the time you have to dissolve it will will change. So first of all, you you prep your station. You uh, you need uh, to uh, do just a sclerite preparation, uh, a glass or a plastic petri dish, and you're going to put your uh, polyp, and uh, you just need a drop or two of ISO bleach. You can use it undiluted, it will go fast, or you can use it diluted, and then you have time to uh, react if it, uh, if you see that uh, uh, it goes too fast and you don't see where the, where the sclerites fall on the different parts of the polyp, right? Because the tentacles and the body wall, et cetera, can have different types of sclerites. If you're lucky, they fall into place after all the tissue is digested, you have the tentacle sclerites, the body wall sclerites, the branch sclerites, and it's all neat and easy to interpret. So um, then you, uh, you rinse it with a deionized water. And uh, I use a plastic, a simple plastic pipette, but you can use a micro pipette, a P1000 pipette uh, to, uh, to rinse it. And, uh, and then your sclerites can be prepared. So, Usually what people do is uh, SEM, so scanning electron microscope to, uh, to photograph the, uh, the sclerites. But uh, uh, I and other people have used uh, light microscopy as well, but with uh, Z stacking. Um, does anyone doesn't know, don't know what uh, Z stacking is? Yeah, okay, so uh, you have a, um, basically you have a, a light microscope uh, that is a, uh, robotic and uh, you will um, set the depth of focus to uh, to the plate of your preparation and then you will take a picture go uh, up one micron take a picture go up one micron etc and then a computer will combine all these uh, areas of the picture that are in focus remove the rest and make a, a compound uh, picture and this for sclerites and for uh, for um, polyps it, it's, it's actually very good and it goes faster than doing a SEM prep. So you might be lucky and have a, a, a microscope that does Z-stacking at your university or lab. Uh, and it's, uh, in my opinion, it's worth uh, looking into because it's faster. So for example, I put a, a brand here, it's called Kians. These microscopes are really good and they, they do Z-stacking. If you need to transfer your sclerites onto a SEM stub or 
um, you can do so with a small painting brush, you know, uh, not a brush, you know, uh, for uh, building paint, but, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, like RT. And uh, you can cut with scissors uh, the extra br uh, bristles so that you just have, the, you know, like 10 bristles or so. Mm. And uh, you touch it, uh, you touch the scarrets and they get stuck between bristles. And it's a good way to actually uh, prepare your steps. So if you want to prepare a polyp that looks like this, uh, then it's important to, to set up uh, dishes that will stop the dissolution of tissue. So you have a, a Petri dish that has uh, deionized de water, and you can have also uh, some uh, oxygen peroxide. And uh, so I put, put use fresh also the bleach because uh, when it gets old, the bleach tend to be uh, less uh, uh, active. It's uh, not as good as dissolving uh, tissues. And uh, if you want to keep your um, bleach powerful, keep it in the fridge. So if you do a lot of uh, preparations like that. So you can look at your polyp dissolve, and as soon as you see that, uh, you know, the, the upper uh, layer of epidermis is, uh, is gone, is the, uh, dissolved, then you take your polyp and uh, you put it in a in the deionized water. And usually what I do is I leave uh, the polyp on the branch and I hold my polyp by the branch so I don't uh, break my polyp. And the oxygen peroxide, uh, oxygene in French, it's uh, meant for shaking off uh, uh, tissue debris and having a clean uh, preparation. And again, you can use that on an SEM or on a light microscope with uh, Z stacking. And this was done with this stacking, but um, actually with the lights, you know, it's not uh, it's not that uh, that good. Like this. Oh. So this was done with this stacking, and you can see the orientation of sclerites. This is actually a rare taxon, it's Metallogorgia macrospina. And you can see why it's called microspina because the regular Metallogorgia has very tiny sclerites like this all over. And the microspina has uh, sclerites that are almost as tall as the antocodia. Okay, so getting back to uh, the systematics. Uh, it's been one hour. Do you guys want to have a break or uh, should I get going? I have uh, half an hour, I think. Now, how many do you have half of yours? Okay. No, I think I have uh, like a half an hour left or so. Do you? Yes. I finish? Okay. So these are the family that are uh, uh, valid as of today based on the rev revisionary work by Cathy McFadden, uh, Lynn Van Erfwegen, and uh, Andrea Quattrini. They are a families of Octocorallia that have a solid calcified skeletal axis occur in the Pacific in deep water. So this is where it's a subset. I group them uh, artificially. Uh, those both are sometimes called golden coral. I see it for Chrysogorgidae and for Primoidae, golden corals. Uh, these have very uh, uh, fancy sclerites with a lot of ornamentation. They are large and uh, uh, you've seen the, the movie Rocket Man with uh, Elton John. So like that with feathers and crazy, crazy uh, sclerites. And Chrysogorgidae has very uh, uh, minute, smooth sclerites. Uh, the Coralidae uh, can could be called the red corals because most of uh, what is put in that bin is red. Corallium, Paragorgia now, uh, and Tomastus, uh, Batialcion, they tend to be red. So that's why I uh, put it aside. These are the bamboo-like uh, corals, coral families. So 
the uh, genuine ICD day uh, is not anymore because the type uh, of the family, Isis Epuris, uh, is um, paraphyletic uh, uh, re, uh, in comparison to uh, the rest of the deep bamboo corals. Okay, so ICD day still exists, but it contains just Isis Epuris, the type of the the family, and it's a shallow water taxon, so it's not in my list, okay? And so most of the bamboos that uh, you are going to find are Kerato ICD Day, which is a subfamily that was elevated to family level. Kelidoni ICD Day uh, is a monogeneric uh, family, and so I, I won't uh, detail it. Uh, Isidoide, is a shy bamboo because it has, doesn't have nodes. Uh, so it's, uh, it looks like a bamboo and it, it's been a taxonomic curiosity for uh, most of its life and it's monogeneric, so I won't uh, detail it. You have the, uh, then you have uh, groups, actually I could group all those that tend to be shallower, the Ediselidae, Ideogorgidae, uh, Ifalukelidae, uh, uh, the Pleurogorgidae, and the uh, Pterogorgidae. So we'll see uh, these families. Okay. Uh, I don't expect you to read all the diagnosis right now, of course, but I put all of it so that uh, when we're working, you want to go to the diagnosis, we can have it on the screen. And if you want the PDF, you will have the diagnosis handy. But of course, it's better to uh, to refer to the original uh, text, which is uh, McFadden and all, 2022, in the BSL journal. So the Primnoidae is one of these uh, of the two families which you can see uh, called golden corals because of the color of the axis. The Primnoidae is, is can be quite golden, sometimes a little black. Um, it's a uh, continuous cal calcium carbonate, uh, except for one uh, taxon, Myrostenella, uh, which superficially looks like a bamboo cause because it's, it has a jointed axis, but it really is a primnoid cause. It's not a bamboo core. Okay. So do not think that because you see joints, uh, nodes and internodes, it's a bamboo core. No, uh, there are exceptions to that. Not many, but there are some. Okay, so myrostenella. Phylogenetically, there is no ambiguity that it's a primnoid. And uh, so this is one very important character. And then, as I said before, it has these very fancy polyps that we're going to look at that are heavily armored. This is in the diagnosis, the official diagnosis, with calcareous scales that are usually arranged and in an imbricate manner. So this is a this is a primnoid, the genus Cal, um, Calogorgia, uh, with its um, ophiurid associates. And uh, when you uh, look at the polyps, you can see these plates of armors that I I talked about. So this is the skeletal axis, and you can see all these plates. The entirety of the polyp is uh, protected by uh, these uh, scarets and. They can have an operculum, so plates that cover the tentacles and protect the tentacles, and there are eight of them, or multiple. Uh, I think uh, I'm not an expert of the group, but I think you can have a multiple of eight on the operculum. This is the operculum that protects the, the tentacles and the calyx of, uh, of sclerites. So very ornamented, prickly. Yeah. To be sure, the operculum is calcareous. Yes. So very ornamented polyps, and you can feel it in your hands, and you can see it. Uh, yeah. Then another genus that I see sometimes called golden corals is the Chrysogorgidae. And these are have uh, the, the axis, which is very strong. Actually, it's not very pliable. If you try to flex it, it will break. Uh, it, uh, so it's brittle, 
and uh, but don't try you know to uh, flex it because uh, or you talk to Magali afterwards. Uh, it has a metallic luster. Uh, it's it tends to be iridescent, meaning that when you move it around, you will see the colors uh, changing, and they are metallic looking uh, colors. Uh, the polyps are monomorphic, so now you, you know that it means that it only has uh, autozoids. They are non-retractile, non but contractile. So when you are just contractile, it means that the tentacles can just, um, you know, contract, but they cannot hide in the, in the body wall of the core. So you have, you have a polyps that can actually go into the branch and you barely see them anymore. It's not the case of uh, the Chrysoborg. Okay, so, you know, within the genus Chrysogor Chrysogorgia, which is uh, one of the, uh, the seven recognized, yeah, it's seven, no, yes, uh, one of the seven recognized genera for Chrysogorgidae, uh, Chrysogorgia is the more species. There are over 60 species now uh, that are, um, that are described, it's uh, it's in in my opinion in, still in need of uh, 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 um, thorough revision, and um, um, this is a very cosmopolitan uh, taxon. Then you have Iridogorgia, and uh, uh, so uh, there are spiraling colonies that can be quite tall, and they can be several meters tall. And I think the deep the the largest known is seven meters high. Uh, it was um, uh, photographed of Hawaii. And uh, these colonies have side branches that uh, emerge from one side of the spiral. This is why you, it looks like a, a fountain almost. Actually, one species is called Iridogorgia fontinalis. This is a Metallogorgia mel melanotrichos. Uh, and uh, this is a, a peculiar coral. It's, a, it's uh, unambiguous when you see it. It's, it's a long stalk that can be a, a meter and a half tall and a bush of branches. And within that bush of branches, uh, you have a single ophioroid, uh, Ophiocreas oedipus. And to my knowledge, we've never seen two ophioroids or zero ophioroid on Metallogorgia, and we have never seen uh, Ophiocreas oedipus on another substrate. So the, the relationship seems to be very strong. Um, when it's an, another mystery is that uh, when it's a juvenile, it has side branches along the skeletal axis here. And when it grows to the adult form, what we think is the adult form, the side branches fall off or are broken, or we don't know what happens, but you see scars, like you see one here, and these branches disappear. You just have the poof of branch at the top. And no, nobody knows uh, why. There is another genus that I didn't uh, illustrate here, which is called Pseudochrysogorgia, that looks superficially like Chrysogorgia, but is uh, more closely related morphologically and genetically to Metallogorgia. And it's interesting because it also has an uh, associate that seems to be very uh, um, uh, strongly uh, associated with it. And it's all only uh, always one uh, one individual. So this is a seaweed, uh, radicipes. It's the field of, of little uh, unbranched colonies that I showed you before. And uh, there are other taxa that can look like it. For example, Funiculina is a sea pen that can really look like uh, radicipes. Uh, there are some uh, bamboo corals that look a, a bit like this, or some uh, uh, black corals. But when you come closer, you see that there are uh, black corals or bamboos. Funiculina is uh, really tough to tell apart from uh, pictures. Uh, so this is a polyp of Chrysogorgidae, and you can see that the sclerites are very uh, um, uh, small, unornamented, uh, smooth. 
So the chorality is what I call the, the red corals. And the polyps in this group are dimorphic. Uh, so you have reproductive siphonozoids and feeding autozoids, so with the tentacles, uh, retractile into the synanchyme or, cort or cortex. So it's, it's quite stunning. Uh, corallium, hemichorallium, Oh. <laughs> I'm missing a picture. Corallium, hemicorallium, paragorgia, batialcyon. They are all they all belong to this Corallidae family. Um, so the missing picture is a uh, paragorgia. It's the bubblegum coral that I showed at the beginning. Red, tall, with red balls. This is why it's called uh, bubblegum coral, I think. And it's a coral that uh, have a skeletal axis that can be uh, very large in section, uh, probably hundreds of uh, years old. And uh, the colonies can be several meters tall as well. Coralidae. So this is a Kerato Icididae. So this is the deep sea bamboo uh, corals. So these have a jointed skeletal axis of hollow or solid internodes of non-sclerotic calcium carbonate. Uh, and I've been, uh, I remember reading that these internodes can be used as a prosthesis uh, in dentistry because um, the calcium carbonate is very pure. The polyps are monomorphic, non-retractile, but uh, contractile. And you will see that they are quite ornamented with the uh, sclerites. These sclerites can be needles, spindles, rods, or scale arranged longitudinally or obliquely along the, the polyp uh, body. And uh, you can have uh, uh, a crown uh, of uh, sclerites at the base of the tentacles. So this is the skeleton of uh, uh, a Kerato Day, which used to be a subfamily, is now family. Okay, this is Acanella dispar. The Acanella are bushes. And these are polyps of Acanella. You can see these crowns of uh, needles sticking out that can probably serve as protection against the polychids. Uh, the Elicelidae, uh, I, I, I won't uh, go into, um, into the, the, the diagnosis uh, so much. Uh, the more striking feature uh, to me are the sclerites, which are double clubs. So this is a double club. Like this. And uh, this can be quite flashy, and they occur uh, in moderately deep, uh, a little, uh, they can be under 200 meters depth, but uh, they occur uh, also in shallow water, uh, as you can see on this picture. If I look at it, they, uh, uh, have a colony branches that goes from lyrate, dichotomous, pinnet, or irregular lateral. And again, they have uh, sclerites that are uh, either absent or rare. Uh, so this is an uh, this is Ifalukella. Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I had a picture of the sclerites. Uh, the Pleurogorgidae is composed of two genera, and um, it's very uh, brittle, uh, 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 delicate. Uh, coral colony, have a close up. And he, it used to be in the Chrysogorgi day. I, I strike it. Uh, so this is a Pleurogorgi day now. Um, and it com it's composed of uh, only uh, two, uh, two genera among which uh, Pleurogorgia. And you can see that uh, it has some. Uh, some uh, Highly ornamented uh, sclerites, along with plates. This is called a plate. Okay. Uh, Pterogorgidae uh, is uh, uh, a family with the 
old genera of Plexoridae and Gorgonidae. Okay, and these can be uh, Diconomus, Pinnate, uh, Planner, Bushy, so a lot of uh, diversity in the uh, form of the colony. Uh, and the, the polyps are monomorphic, they are retractile into the, 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 uh, the selenkine, which means that uh, when the colony is disturbed, taken out of the water, you don't see the polyps anymore. And uh, this is a, a muriceopsis, and this can occur in shallow water as well. Uh, and uh, um, you can see that uh, the, the scarrets here, it's a uh, light microscopy, that can be also very... Uh, uh, ornamented, and I think this is the uh, the last the last one. Yay! So Ideogorgidae is one. It's uh, it's composed of one. It's monogeneric, and uh, it's I I think it's quite rare, and there is no reason for us to see it here. Uh, um, it's uh, it has a thick uh, skeletal axis and thick uh, senanchyme. Uh, you have triple clubs, ornamented triple clubs, and uh, the polyps are uh, retractile. Uh, retractile in permanent calyces. Okay. So, of course, uh, I realize this is a lot of information. Uh, I don't know how much of it is familiar to you, uh, but uh, given that we had a lot of material, to cover, what I would propose is that uh, if you're interested, if you're interested in uh, in uh, having a, a try at uh, doing a scleride preparation, poly preparation, we can do that with bleach, and uh, look at uh, the, the the sclerites under uh, dissecting scope. If you're familiar with uh, these taxa and uh, want to to see some diversity, uh, you can uh, uh, unless uh, counter. Uh, counter orders by uh, uh, Magali. Uh, we can look at these uh, different families. Otherwise, um, families that are abundant and quite easier to, uh, to distinguish, in my experience, are the primnoidae because they are so uh, 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 ornamented. The Chrysogorgidae have very different uh, uh, forms like the spirals and uh, the branching patterns, the branching sequence, I'm sorry. So they can be taken apart uh, quite easily. The Coralidae are the, the red corals, and then the bamboo corals are easy to take apart. So if, you, if, if all of this is new to you, the first four is going to be, are going to be the easier to take apart. Okay. And... Uh, that's that's what I have. I hope uh, that uh, I didn't say uh, too many mistakes, and uh, I will be happy to answer your questions if you have any. The recording. Yes, please. You have to. Do you want to stop? Stop the Oui. Les trois petits points autres. Trois petits points autres. Euh, enregistrer et transcrire et normalement, tu peux arrêter.